Our next panel will discuss the increasing use of digital twins in the healthcare industry. Please welcome Guide House partner, Dr. Anthony Cristillo. Hello, welcome back. Um, and thank you very much for joining us for this uh, panel discussion on digital twins. Um, I'm, a very, I'm honored to be chairing this session, moderating it with uh, some extraordinary individuals that span um, different elements of health and health care. And so I thought before we get into introductions, and I, I will let each panelist introduce themselves, um, I thought I'd give you a bit of a background on digital twins, just a 30 second to one minute kind of high level overview uh, of it. And I think this morning's session with Todd Marks um, on the metaverse and that panel discussion was, uh, was pretty uh, exciting. And Todd did a great job kind of touching on digital twins in his example of the ski slope and uh, sensors, uh, looking at different elements of, of, the, of the actual mountain or hill. And so I'd like to go along those lines and kind of take a step back and kind of review what, what are we talking about in the context of a digital twin. And I'll, I'll give you a classic uh, definition, and it's a virtual model designed to accurately reflect a physical object. So in the context of health, let's take an example of manufacturing. Let's just say we're manufacturing, I don't know, a vaccine. So think of the bioreactor within this vaccine manufacturing plant. And so the object being studied is outfitted with sensors uh, related to uh, vital areas of functionality. These sensors produce data about different aspects of the physical object's performance, energy output, temperature, uh, production levels. This data is relayed back to a processing system and applied to the digital copy. And once informed with such data, the virtual model now can be used to run simulations. We can study performance, we can think about potential issues, generate possible improvements. In, in, a, in essence, we're ultimate, the ultimate goal here is to generate insight that can be applied back to the original physical object. With that backdrop, um, let's get into our uh, esteemed panelists. We have uh, Dr. Shireen Atabaki uh, from Children's National Hospital. We have Dr. Rod Fantasia, uh, a, a Chief Innovation Officer and Partner at Guidehouse. And Dr. Chung Park, a Professor at George Washington University uh, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And so I will ask each panelist to take about five minutes and uh, introduce themselves and answer the first question, which is, what do digital twins mean in the context of your area of health or expertise, and what, what problems do they help solve? So, Dr. Aktabaki. Hi, um, thank you for inviting me in today for this really exciting discussion, a very cutting edge, uh, innovative. Um, I am uh, an emergency medicine physician and pediatrician at Children's National Hospital and have uh, built my work on uh, clinical decision support in pediatrics and digital health, telehealth, mobile applications of health, and um, really working towards uh, building the virtual hospital of the future for our health system. And so uh, as it comes uh, you know, to digital twins, I think the virtual hospital in itself is virtual. So when we're talking about a real physical um, functionality or concept, it itself is virtual. And so I think a lot of the other digital models that we'll be talking about today are, are similar. So it's basically a digital twin of a virtual, <laughs> a virtual platform that we're talking about. And our goal really with a lot of this work has been to ensure access to care equitably and the highest quality of care for a child no matter where they're located, whether it be in rural West Virginia, in Africa, or in Washington DC, you know, physically in our hospital or within our health system. And uh, a lot of the work I've done has been partnering with engineering and uh, implementation scientists and uh, 
really a lot of software engineers around the electronic medical record, making sure that we have appropriate algorithms and AI embedded into our systems to ensure both highest quality care and the safest care possible. Excellent. Thank you very much. Dr. Fantasia. Yeah, thank you, Tony. And um, Rod Fantasia, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Guy House. Uh, my background is in data. I've uh, been working with data for about 30 years. This is a data world nowadays. I mean, data drives almost everything out there. And what I love about the digital twin is it's an opportunity to bring a lot of technologies that we use on our innovation platforms. Uh, you talk about this morning about 5G sensors, the AI ML, uh, the ability to ingest this large amount of data to help us build these digital environments where not only we can do simulations, but also take a look at the real, real time, what's going on, whether it's manufacturing, and on the health arena, it's fascinating because we're looking at use cases like digital twin of a patient. So think about with, the, I mean, looking at the patient journey and looking at all the, uh, the, the information that we're capturing about a particular patient, uh, be able eventually to look first at the digital twin of a patient in the case of drug interactions, for instance. What may happen if we have this humongous amount of data being populated and be able to run that? Or uh, I love your idea of the virtual hospital because we're looking about how to simulate an emergency room, perhaps. I mean, look at the uh, tracking the medical devices within the, uh, at the, an, an emergency room. Where are the nurses? Where are the doctors? Be able even, and then to simulate what would happen if you get uh, a big uh, you know, accident out there and you get hundreds of people coming to the hospital. How are you going to manage that? So the opportunities are immense. I mean, out there when you start looking at bringing all those technologies together and start building these digital worlds um, from the simulation in the real time. That's what I love it. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Park. Yeah. yeah, it is my pleasure to be here, and it's good to meet such bright people and listen to many ideas. Uh, I'm an associate professor in George Washington University, Department of Biomedical Engineering and in School of Engineering and Applied Science, and I direct the uh, Assistive Robotics and Telemedicine Lab. So when I founded the lab with telemedicine in the world, people thought, you're an engineer, why do you care about telemedicine? This is a, they just use Zoom to meet with the patient. That's telemedicine, right? So now we are talking about digital twin and virtual hospital, and now it excites me. I think the time is coming. Uh, so for me, I work on um, researching on uh, providing, developing assist robotics for people with disabilities, and, uh, and in expanding that technology to provide connected health, connected care, um, monitoring and pro uh, diagnosis, and individualized, assist personalized assistance. Uh, in terms of digital twin, so I think the technology itself, as, as Tony mentioned, is just a digital copy and representation of oneself on an object in virtual space. And we focus on, in terms of engineering, we focus on how do we capture the sensory data, sensory modality, and present to the digital world, and also model and then provide data and interaction through virtual space. So for me, my research focus on digital twin might be how can a person learn from those virtual interactions, how to uh, build a model and, and transfer knowledge through those virtual experiences, and how can a virtual agent in AI or AI or machine learning can learn from those interactions about human data, human uh, health, and then also how to better develop its capability to interact with humans. So that's my take. That's exciting. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated across the board in terms of the different applications within health. In your context um, with the robotics, with that human interaction, getting back to what Rod said about data, it's data, real-time data. You have the sort of challenge and excitement of trying to capture almost that, beha that behavioral data, the human engagement. One example is I know that you're working on uh, robotics interaction with uh, children with autism. And, and, and that must be both exciting, but also very challenging to study and to ga gauge that 
sort of behavioral data, collect that behavioral data, and then apply it to uh, the models that you, you speak of. Right. Is that what you're finding? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want me to answer those? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we initially started with physical robots. We wanted to build a robot system that can um, be in the playground with children with autism, so they can play with it while not intentionally providing therapy, experiencing therapy. They can indirectly go through those interventions with robotic systems. Um, so with the parents' uh, consent, we kind of made the robot to collect data, analyze their behaviors, and then and provide more customized care and intervention. Now the pandemic had hit us, and we had to, we had to uh, force to change to uh, virtual space. So that's why the discipline was quite the right suit for us and is on the way. The thing is that um, there are lots of challenges, not just data and de collecting data or analyzing the behaviors. The infrastructure is not there yet. We are talking about 5G and metaverse. It's not for everyday use. We are not there yet for, for equitable services. Um, and also with the current technology, we have come a lot, a long way. Zoom and, and WebEx, all those technologies has made us sustain through pandemic and meetings. Uh, but still, it's not good enough to provide digital twin and real-time interaction. So in that sense, we still, we're still learning more about different ideas. Understood. Um, Dr. Tabaki, in, in the context of the hospital, whether it be the emergency room or the hospital as a whole, within those four walls, applying the digital twins, what do you see as some of the, in, the challenges? Is it infrastructure? If it is infrastructure, what is needed to really move the concept forward and the field forward? Yeah, well, one of the things that has been most noticeable in healthcare during this technologic revolution we've seen in the last 15, 20 years has been how healthcare has remained so siloed to date. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting, you know, I always, I always make this analogy, my, you know, 17-year-old son can very easily go to Google Health and get a lot of information about his healthcare, sign up for a um, platform where he can get his own medical records, he can communicate with his provider, he can do a lot of things. But within health systems, because of firewalls and other issues, and some of it is cost and infrastructure, that's very siloed. I can't do a lot of those things, even as a provider or a leader um, in digital technology and digital healthcare for my patients. And I think the, the real goal of um, you know, the, the digital twin model and these other uh, models where we can create you know, virtual models of healthcare is to try to overcome those silos. But infrastructure is very important. Right now, um, uh, we applied for and received an FCC Connected Care Pilot Program Award. Um, we had a COVID-19 Telehealth Program Award through the FCC. And you know, together that's about you know three, three, four million dollars. And without that, we could not have built you know the systems that we have. We have robots in our ERs now. We have robots in our critical care units. We have AI looking at algorithms based on metrics from health monitors like vital signs, um, feeding into a mathematical modeling system. We have a virtual telemedicine command center. And basically in our cardiac ICU, for example, we can deploy a robot to the patient's bedside based on feedback from that algorithm to prevent a serious critical event. So we can early identify this. The ultimate goal is to be able to have this for all our patients across the health system and even in the community. That's wonderful. That's excellent. Um, it, let me turn the attention for a moment because to, to Rod and the concept of, that he brought up of the patient journey. He mentioned the patient journey, and I know that um, probably a couple years ago, um, Rod embarked on a vaccine portal, developing a vaccine portal to look at adverse events in the context of vaccines, safety events, really, adverse events um, with respect to different vaccines that are on the market and specifically when COVID hit and we started looking at Moderna and Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson vaccines, he was able to pull disparate data together and look at on-label, off-label events for the purpose of informing, informing uh, manufacturers, informing the FDA, informing the patient. 
And so I guess my question is, is there a role for digital twins in that context, in the context of understanding, getting to a little bit of what Dr. Park was saying, really, understanding adoption. You know, the, the concept of, in the old days, some of us thought if you build it, they will come. That's not always the case. So is there a role for digital twins in understanding Interesting, patient? yeah. I think that from the point of view, just like you're mentioning, be able to ingest data and be able to analyze the data. I mean, I love the idea of having the robots feeding me data, medical devices feeding me data, then having the AI and the ML algorithms start predicting what may happen or, or what is the best uh, action to take. I mean, that's fascinating. I think the digital twins from that point of view be able to ingest on a structured data. There's 80% of the data is on a structure at the end of the day and be able to ingest it, analyze it, correlate it, and then creating insights for uh, the doctors, I mean the nurses, and be able to inform them mm -hmm. of what's going on and, and start predicting also behavior perhaps of patients from that point of view and be able to do that virtually first and then be able to do it at the real time. I, I think that's the power of the digital twin at the end of the day, be that capacity of ingest the data and analyze it real time and then allow you doctors and nurses and researchers to do the work digitally, don't spend too much money on the physical first, be able to do it digitally and then see the consequences and then be able to apply uh, on, the, on the physical aspect. I mean, same for even policy creation when you think about it. I mean, one of the use cases that we, we've been looking at is uh, providing a digital twin to the TSA. I mean, wouldn't you love to have a better interaction with the TSA when you travel? <laughs> Right, I mean, and be able for them to, you know, have a digital environment where they can play with the policies and change policies, first on the digital side, right. uh, from the point of view of the travel interaction, the traveler interaction, and the traveler journey. Uh, so I think there is an opportunity, not only on the health arena, but that's what we're doing, is trying to look across all the industries and how digital trend can be, impact the business. Excellent. I guess the question now for, for each of you that, I, that I, I'd love to explore a little bit is you, you have an idea of what you've started down this journey of implementing digital twins, exploring digital twins in the context of each of your industries. Where do you see this going? What is the next iteration of digital twins? So in the context of the hospital, um, you gave us some lovely examples within the emergency room, within the, the, the four walls of the hospital. Where could it go? Well, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, it's something I think about all the time and work with my colleagues. Our, our chief innovation officer, Dr. Eskandanian, is uh, incredible at really um, pushing us to, to think out of the, out of the box around um, these types of concepts. But population health is really where I see this going. I mean, the ability to be able to follow a child from childhood, identify genetic markers, let's say for cancer, and prevent it early on. Why are we waiting for you know, mammograms when you're 45 or this or that? And we're seeing a, so much you know, increase in this. Why can't we, or, or diabetes, you know, and we're, we're, we're still today in 2022, we're amputating people's legs because they're having complications from diabetes. This is something can, can be completely prevented early diagnosis, early intervention, but also communicating with the patient, you know, making sure that we have a digital communication with the patient and the family because everybody's online now. Um, everybody has very quick access to, you know, mobile phones and text messages, and, but making sure that we guide that family and patient, you know, in this journey and really have preventive health, mental health, suicide, I mean, we're just seeing such a tremendous increase in suicides, in cardiac disease. Um, it's, it's just amazing to me why in 2022, we, we, haven't, we have these solutions. Why haven't we been able to implement them? So that's what I'd love to see, is us, us all coming together as teams to really take that next step. You know, it, it, it's even unusual to me today that why, why are we even having this discussion? We should just be out there just do doing it. the work. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm throwing the gauntlet down for all of you to, to help us uh, do this together. Excellent. Dr. Park, 
What, where do you see this going for you and for, for that your area of research? I think Sri mentioned many aspects of what you are envisioning, and then I think that's the fantastic view of the future. Uh, for, for an engineer and researcher, I think to get there, there are so many technologies needed to fill in the gaps. Um, so previously, the te technology was in the labs and the experiments were happening in, in controlled environments. Now the technology is everywhere. It's with us. It's, we are wearing it. We are holding it. And then to, even in digital twin, to, the technology applied to virtual space now. To get there, we need to uh, kind of perfect the technology first. And then besides uh, the technology itself, uh, for the people to use it adaptively and then easily, there's a study we need to do with the people's interaction and acceptance of the technology as well. So how the technology is affordable, acceptable, and usable is also another aspect to study. And then I think it was mentioned in the previous panel in, in some sense with the usability. So, so that, that's what I think. In terms of view, I think there's the endless view. Yeah. <laughs> um, Rod, where do you see this going? Where could this go? Oh, I mean, the sky is the limit. I mean, I mean, just think about how technology is evolving exponentially fast, right? I mean, it's uh, the advances that used to take 10 years. I mean, I mean just uh, like you were saying, I mean, the digital transformation, all of a sudden with the pandemic, people that had plans for five years or, oh, yeah, we can wait. In three months or six months, they had to change dramatically fast. And technology is there and keep advancing. So I, I think on the digital twin, it will, will, will get to the metaverse, I think, definitely. And, uh, but I love the idea of the patient journey and be able to start early and track that and, and lo looking at, the, uh, you know, at those factors that can help us predict because we have so much information, so much data. And I think we're getting to the point with, where we're limited by the fact that we cannot share that data effectively. And, you know, all the data go to, you know, Epic, Cerner, but then you have different people have different data. It's your data. It's the patient data. Why don't I, I'm the one having my data and be able to have it on my fingertips and, and then allow other, you know, providers or payers to, to use my data. But perhaps I, I need to get remunerated for them using my data also. I mean, so I think that concept of bringing the data in to be able to start making predictions early on, don't wait until you're 45, 50 to start identifying you with prostate cancer. I mean, can you t take a look at the, at the factors early on and be able to do that? I think we do have the data now. It's the ability to share data and to bring it all in one place so we can analyze it. We can apply the AI, the ML, all that technology. I think the technology is there, and it's going to I mean, continue advancing, but it's that ability to get our hands into the data and don't put that many restrictions into it. I understand the, all the, the policies around security and privacy and all that, definitely. We need to maintain those, but you know, we need to advance the science, and, and we need to make the, that data available to everyone to, to play with it. So, so I have the, the, the good fortune of having a professor at GW, professor at GW, adjunct professor at AU, you see the next group of individuals coming out, the next group of scientists, of data scientists, of technologists. Do you see any challenges with respect to our ability to continue, uh, I'll use the, the term, cranking out the necessary human resources that are needed to help continue to develop these tools continue exploiting these tools f for the purpose of digital twins. Where are we with, with our education and our training of those types of, of, of specialists? I'll throw it out there for anyone who will take it first. <laughs> okay, you're looking at me first. Yeah. <laughs> go to the engineering school. So, Let's go to the so engineering school. I think the students are with, from, coming from different ages now. I think they're born with uh, cell phones and internet which we didn't have in our early days. So when I saw the, it's, it's a kind of personal story. So when I saw the uh, half, 50% discount of the 23andMe uh, at the Christmas sale, I wanted to buy it. And then I, I was telling my students, how do you think this is? And then they were saying, oh, no, I'm, gonna, no, I'm not going to take it. Why? And they were saying that 
they were smarter than me. They, see, they think that if they take it and then give their genetic data to the, the company, the company can give the data to FBI or other agencies who can review it later. I know this is a private story, and this is not a good example. But they were thinking about different domain, not just technology, but the policy, hold the, hold the society level. And I think as, as, an, as an educator and researcher and, then, and visionaries, I think we need to provide better view of the use of technology. How do you, if you have the big data, how do you use the data? Can you convince the people that the data is safe? They're not gonna use the data, take data from you, and then use it for different purposes. So uh, uh, transparency of the data, security and the protection of the data, privacy, HIPAA, <laughs> I think those are supposed to be handled clearly to provide our advancement in technology and then use of the uh, better purposes. Wonderful. Dr. Tobaki, how, how would, are, we, are, we, are we there with the human resources? Um, <laughs> You know, I think as far as medical students and bioengineering students, I, I have um, PhD students, so a, a, a lot of that, um, that, that cohort um, that I train, they are much more advanced. They learn, you know, digital health, you know, much sooner than my generation does or even the middle generation. It's just incredible. For example, one thing is with the robots, um, when we have the robots going around the emergency department into the code rooms and the trauma bays and things like that, the older staff are kind of scared sometimes when the, and we've oriented them when they see the robot. The kids, they love it. Our trainees, they love it. They, they, you know, they'll be hiding behind their parent when I go in with my white coat to say hello. And then I go back into the room, I take my mask and everything off, my PPE off, and um, I talk to them through the robot. And then they're running out, they're trying to you know, touch the robot. They, they love it. They love technology, that's their world. And the residents, too, a lot of them can write code. It's a whole different world. So, but I don't think we're putting the resources into it right now. I think we have to shift our focus. And it was interesting you mentioned the electronic medical record. We still today are using the electronic medical record for word processing. We were talking about a resource that was hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for each organization. And we are using it for word processing. We still can't easily put clinical decision support into it. We still can't put machine learning, AI models into it easily. Um, you know, we have to go through a lot of hurdles to do that. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the security issues around, you know, healthcare are really not protecting the patient because the individuals or teams or groups that need to get your information for commercial purposes are getting it, frankly. They are receiving it through Internet of Things, wearable devices. Um, it, it, it just is siloing healthcare more. So we have to figure out a way to improve that and um, really focus the next generation on innovation, sort of letting people think and train outside of the box. Um, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Um, Rod, you, you have access to data scientists right out of school. I know that you've, uh, you're big on um, internships and, and helping to train young people coming to the table. Um, what is your view of the, of the future with respect to the, that human capital? Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, I, I, mean, I mean, we in our company, I mean, how many open recs do we have? I mean, hundreds of them were looking for people, I mean, and, uh, at, at all levels. And, um, and unfortunately, I teach at American University, I mean, and, and I don't see enough data scientists or people that want to work with data and want to help us analyze the data. And, um, and, and that's too bad, I mean, because it's, it's very well remunerated. I mean, salaries, I've been telling my friends I have teenagers where they want to go to school, I'm like, you know, data science. I mean, <laughs> as you know, I mean, you want to make 200, 300,000 a year, I mean, go for that field, I mean, right? And uh, so we're missing, I mean, somehow we need to do more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, companies big like ours, they, we need to spend money training uh, our workforce as well. I mean, encourage uh, folks to, you know, get into the technology and the data science side as well. And um, so I think it's an effort that goes across the board. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's necessary, I mean, and we, we need to encourage education. I mean, give grants, I mean, in different population. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a lot of work to be done there. I think we're advancing more in the technology side that, that in that area. I mean, right. um, 
I, I don't want to leave a couple of, of uh, areas or applications of digital twins out of the discussion. Uh, and I know that um, uh, we've been talking about um, some, some behavioral research, some interactions with the, the robots and the patients, the digital hospital, the digital patient. Um, I, I, I would like to mention, you know, in the context of biopharma, um, we've all had some engagement with some of our colleagues in biopharma who are looking at digital twins in the context of development, clinical, preclinical development of candidate vaccines, therapeutics uh, for different ailments. And, and so one of the fascinating areas I have also found is the, the idea of bringing digital twins to the mix, the real-time data that uh, everyone has spoken about in terms of understanding whatever the physical object is, in this case, um, the, the, the drugs, the, the vaccines, the biologics, and, and truly being able to sort of simulate, stress the system and ask the question in a predictive way, you know, which ones are the best ones to take forward to the clinic? Reducing the time to get uh, vaccines and therapeutics uh, and medical devices on the market and available. Um, so I think that's a, a, an also a, a very fascinating area to sort of complement um, the, the discussion that we've had today uh, so far. Um, so I want to open it up. I know we have about nine minutes left, and um, I thought we'd open it up to some questions from the floor and, and online um, for anyone, for the, the panelists. Right there. I was just curious about your feelings on the role that open source can play or should have been playing leading up to now. I know that there's been a lot of proprietary conversations around things like Epic and those kind of things. And when you get to talking about data portability and a lot of these pieces, I just love to get your take on what you hope for the future as it relates to open source and maybe what you see is actually playing out. Thank you. I, I gotta start because I love open data. I mean, it's an open source. I mean, it's, that's definitely the way we go after when we bring innovation to the marketplace is really relying on that open data and, and open source software as well. Um, so I will encourage, I mean, I love health.data.gov. We go there all the time. I mean, portals like the FDA, I mean, Tony was talking about the vaccine surveillance that we built. We did it looking at the FDA, looking at CDC. They are bringing humongous amount of data for us to work with. Uh, it's, uh, it's up to us to use that data, bring it in, correlate it, use the SMEs, uh, like my colleagues here, that understand what are the use cases that we need to build and use that open data and open source to bring new, I mean, solve those use cases and bring innovation uh, into the marketplace. So, love it. I mean, definitely, I mean, I, I hope all the institution will bring some kind of open, open data into the mix. And for um, patient level data, one of the things we're doing, and I, I love your question, I think it's uh, very on point, um, is de-identifying the data. So we have a virtual telemedicine command center, and um, we, pre-pandemic, just to give you an example, we had about 80 direct-to-consumer visits a day in patients' homes, and um, we had about 2,000 over a four-year period. Post-pandemic, we've had 180,000 visits. So it just like ratcheted up. And you can imagine, you know, very quickly. But now we have this tremendous amount of data and working with data scientists in this virtual command center to see what's the best way to provide care and follow some other population health metrics. And one of the routes we've taken is to de-identify the data for, you know, outside of our health system. So it's all de-identified, but we have the critical elements in it. And it is a bit of a back and forth with, you know, regulatory agencies in what, you know, because there's a lot of data that's necessary that might be considered, you know, somewhat like birth dates. So ways to modify that so that it doesn't identify a patient, but you can still utilize it. So um, that, that, has been one route that we've taken. I think it's very feasible and, and easy, and we really need to move very quickly in overcoming that barrier. Other questions? Um, thank you for taking the time to share this knowledge on digital twins. Um, for Dr. Atabaki, I have a question 
um, on um, what are some challenges you experience or are currently experiencing with end user adoption of technology, especially in the hospital with your command center? And what factors do you believe will lead to the sustainment of such infrastructure in healthcare? Um, yeah, the, it, it's interesting. Again, as I mentioned, we did have a lot of uh, hesitance, especially for older providers, nurses, doctors, technicians, et cetera. Um, but with COVID, we were forced to quickly change that model. And so now 100% of our providers are licensed and providing care through telehealth. Previously, it was you know, maybe 30 40%, and we had early adopters. That, that has changed dramatically. I think for a lot of other systems, but as we see a new generation of providers and healthcare professionals coming, th their experience is very different. They're, 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 they don't have the same hesitance or concern about adopting um, you know, a lot of this uh, digital and innovative technology. And simulation actually is very helpful, even for the older teams. And uh, um, for example, we, we just started a school health program for the District of Columbia. So we're one of the first um, states or, or in, in DC to um, provide telehealth for all DC, 225 DC public and public chartered schools as of February 14, and it's a program I'm the medical director for. And um, you know, the school nurses have various experience. You know, they're, they're different ages, and um, we make sure that we have a, a, a nurse available right at the elbow as we deploy this, and really there to help them go through the first steps. Same thing with families. We have patient family navigators to help the families, because you know, a lot of this is novel, but I'm amazed at how the younger generation, you know, gets this much, much more quickly and rapidly than, than others. So it's very promising. I don't think the end user adoption is going to be a big issue moving forward. But, but thank you. That's I mean, always important to, to consider. If I can piggyback on that, uh, you, you raised something very interesting, less about the, the stakeholder, the end user, and more the provider and the sort of cultural divide or mix. And I guess the question is moving forward, introducing sort of that simulations or real-time data lessons learned across the, even though there's 100% adoption because there has to be, do you find yourself now sort of helping to reinforce that with the team moving forward so that those who are still remain a little less comfortable with it benefit from the successes of others within the team. Yeah, absolutely, but we need to be more nimble with it, with it, and that's an area where we need resources. It takes funding. Um, very hard to get data scientists. I love data scientists, but I want to talk to Rod after this. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, very, very, you know, those are the challenges, and health systems don't have the resources right now, so um, very important, very important. Well, I don't see any other questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, kind of ask for some closing remarks. We still have three minutes left, so maybe, um, you know, any final thoughts? I'll start with Dr. Park. Yeah, I mean, we kind of play the digital training in terms of uh, human robot interaction concepts. Um, during the pandemic, we couldn't deploy robots or have children come over to our lab to experience with robotic interaction, so we sent a Zoom call, and then people, child, children were meeting our robot through a digital twin a simulation. And we didn't think that, that could be possible because the network was slow, the, the graphic was not there, but then children were enjoying the experiences. They were perfectly interacting with the digital twin of the uh, robotic system, engaging in dance learning and then interventions. Uh, so in that sense, I think we have a lot of needs and then possibility to move forward to the future. And then if you have so many bright minds to, to guide the way. That's my take. Uh, Rod, final yeah, thoughts? One final thought will be going back to the open source data is uh, one other thing that we're using for, digital, for building digital twins is using synthetic data. So we have, uh, we're using multiple synthetic data generators. So when we don't get that data that we want, we get a little bit of data and then we use synthetic data to enhance the data and at least be able to build the AI and the ML models. I mean, that can give us a little bit of additional insights. Um, so that's another kind of the technology that we're using for digital twins and encourage everybody 
to do it. I mean, because sometimes you don't get the data, unfortunately. I mean, and, and you can, people come with the use cases, our clients come with the use cases, and we have to figure out a way to get those insights. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Atibaki, the last word is with you. Well, I'd love to see a patient portal um, that's one uniform patient portal. Every patient, every individual for their own healthcare has this from childhood on. And you can access a lot of different resources, including being able to identify, you know, early, early identifiers of disease, interventions, um, and it, it goes with you, you know, wherever you go. And unfortunately, that doesn't exist today. And I tell you that, you know, in a very advanced health system, under 30% of our patients and families access a patient portal. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I think that would be the first step, the first thing I'd want to see. And, you know, simulations on that, uh, models of healthcare, how you can manage your care, how you can access care, um, and, you know, easy access to telehealth, et cetera, um, would be fantastic, just as a first, first uh, point of, uh, of departure. And on that note, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists um, for a great discussion today, a very diverse discussion about different applications of digital twins. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.